Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third episode on the H Civil War Author Interview Podcast. And today we have something really fun for you guys. And we're going to Tennessee. And we're not going to talk about the main everyone thinks about when it comes to Tennessee. You know, we're going to talk about somebody else. Today, we are going to talk to Mark Cheatham, who is a professor of history at Cumberland University, which is just east of Nashville. And he is also the editor of the Martin Van Buren Papers, that other important president in the antebellum years. Mark has a PhD from Mississippi State University and is the author and editor of, oh my gosh, nine books, including Andrew Jackson's Southerner, The Coming of Democracy, Presidential Campaigning in the Age of Andrew Jackson, and the book we are going to talk with him about today, Who is James K. Polk? The Presidential Election of 18. 18- 44, published by University Press of Kansas. Mark, thank you for joining us today. Thank so you me. I'm just going to throw it right at you and ask the most difficult question at the start. <laughs> Why are the Martin Van Buren papers in Tennessee? <laughs> yes, I get that question a lot. I um, bet. <laughs> It's a long story, but the short version is uh, right after Andrew Jackson Southerner came out um, over a decade ago now, uh, a there was an individual up in New York who um, asked to meet with me when I went up there to give a talk. And his name was James Bradley. We met in a coffee shop and James pitched the idea of doing a digital edition of Van Buren's papers. Mm. And uh, I was in between publications and thought I had free time, uh, you know, how naive I was. Um, <laughs> and so I came back to the university and asked for permission to start this project. And uh, as my provost uh, has told me after the fact, uh, he said yes, because he didn't think it would ever get off the ground, uh, but it did. And so um, through a set of circumstances, we were able to get microfilm copies of Van Buren's papers and then secured uh you know, the initial funding and things just kind of came together very quickly. And we officially launched on President's Day weekend uh, in 2016. So it's been eight years now that we've officially been up. There were a good number of, I noticed there were a good number of um, Instagram celebration posts there the other day. (laughs) We just had President's Day. Um, Any issues considering you have like Andrew Jackson right next door to you, so to speak? (laughs) Well, one of the things I learned very quickly was to sell Martin Van Buren, you know, a native Mm -hmm. New Yorker to Tennessee. I had to make the Jackson connection. So lots Mm -hmm. of times when people ask a question, you asked, why are you doing these papers in Tennessee? I bring up, you know, the natural connection between Jackson and Van Buren, co-founders of the Democratic Party, served together as president and vice president. Um, And so that seems to ease their mind that, you know, it's not some interloper Yankee who's come south and is trying to, (laughs) you know, take over Jacksonian territory. It's really just uh, a collective a collective effort to try to bring more attention to the Jacksonian period. Yeah. Great. No. Interesting. So um, and now we have two presidents. Jackson we already have. We have uh, Martin Van Buren and you ended up. Uh, topic we're going to talk about neither of the two really <laughs> we're going to talk about james k polk so right. like now we're going to go what about 30 minutes south of nashville <laughs> for his home so yeah. how did you end up now with polk as the next guy to write about so uh in that intervening period after andrew jackson southerner um uh, apparently i was very energetic i was younger and uh <laughs> had big ideas about what my life was going to be like. And so at the same time that I was talking with James about starting the Van Buren papers, I pitched the idea of an 1844 election book to the University Press of Kansas. And they said yes. And so here we are uh, 
10 years later with the book finally out, um, mm-hmm. there were lots of intervening things that happened in the meantime, um, including, you know, a pandemic and uh, trying to get these Van Buren papers off the off the mat. But in, in some ways, even though I was delayed in writing this book, I think in some ways it helped because mm-hmm. in the meantime, I also published The Coming of Democracy and that book looked at presidential campaigning from 1824 to 1840. And I think certainly that book informed a lot of what I did in this book because it really awakened in me um, a heightened awareness of how important cultural politics were. Mm-hmm. So cartoons and songs and rallies and sort of the energizing uh, efforts of campaigning uh, really came to the forefront of my mind. And so I was able to incorporate that into who is James K. Polk. And I think I made it a better book because of that. Oh, yeah. And you you, you can tell like how much of the book is devoted to sort of that background and sort of the importance to to understand the 1848, sorry, 1844 election in its in its context of of the time. And you you kind of getting into the book here, you're looking at a couple of issues leading up to the election. But let's let's start first with the election of 1840, because that's one that you are also devoting time to. And how do you see this sort of as a important starting point for the 1844 election? Yeah, 1840 really frames a lot of what happens in 44. In 1840, uh, when Henry Harrison, the Whig candidate, had defeated the Democratic incumbent, Martin Van Buren, and then a month after Harrison takes office, he dies, and his vice president, John Tyler, takes over. And that really sets the stage for a lot of chaos, honestly, over the next four years, because John Tyler have been put on the Whig ticket really to try to satisfy pro-slavery Southern voters. Mm -hmm. Um, And when he becomes president, he doesn't toe the party line. Uh, The Whigs, people like Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, uh, think that they're going to control Tyler and sort of get him to do what they had wanted Harrison to do. Mm -hmm. And Tyler almost immediately starts to, to buck their, um, directions or their directives and tries to carve out an indep- independent path for himself. And so that chaos leads to him getting kicked out of the Whig party and really makes him a, a president without a party mm-hmm. and um, causes a lot of consternation among the Whigs. Then the Democrats are looking at 44 and they're trying to figure out, you know, do we run Van Buren again? You know, he He had been affected during his presidency by an economic depression. You know, is that just, um, you know, something we need to check off as a one-off and give him another chance? You know, he had been the builder of the Democratic Party in many ways. And so we want to make sure that we give him, you know, a full opportunity to prove himself. But then there are other Democrats who look at Van Buren as a loser and they want to pick someone else who's younger or someone else who's just as experienced but doesn't have Van Buren's baggage. And so really there's a lot of chaos within both parties, Whigs and Democrats, between 40 and 44, as they're trying to figure out what's the best pathway forward for us um, heading into the 44 election. Yeah, but let's not get too far ahead of us there with <laughs> the skeletons in the closets of all the uh, <laughs> candidates. Um, what I really found interesting, though, is that uh, usually when you teach this period and it's sort of like we talk about Andrew Jackson and sort of the Jackson polls and sort of the camp meetings and sort of this new electioneering politics that comes out with Jackson and the 1840 election is so uh, I never really taught much about it so it was nice to see what you had to say about it and it sort of turns the entire narrative on its head of the Whigs using all these techniques so much better than the Democrats who kind of pioneered it all. Yeah, it's it, it's sort of a weird thing uh, that the Democrats don't recognize that they had uh, a, a bag of winning tricks that they just mm-hmm. didn't pull out in 1840 or not as much um, yeah. at the national level, certainly. Um, the Whigs, I think, have the benefit of being the party out of power, so they're willing to try new things. Mm-hmm. 
they're a relatively new party. Um, I mean, you could see the vestiges of or the origins of the party um, before 1834 and certainly before 1836, but they're still trying to figure out what do they stand for besides hating Andrew Jackson. So they're trying to figure <laughs> out what's our platform here. Um, and so I think, you know, their newness allows them to try things and to test things that maybe the Democrats weren't willing to test. And with, if you start at the top of the party with Van Buren, Van Buren knew how to do these things. He knew grassroots mm -hmm. politics was the way to go. He had tested it in New York at the state level, had brought it to the national level with the Democrats. But Van Buren, again, he's distracted by the economy. He's in charge. And so I think maybe there's a little bit of a fear that if he tries too much, that's too different. Maybe that keep him from winning re-election. Um, and what's really interesting is that at the state levels, like in Tennessee, for example, you have people like James K. Polk um, mm -hmm. who are doing the things that the Whigs are doing, you know, stumping and crisscrossing the state and giving all these speeches and um, <clears throat> doing all the things that the Whigs are doing. But at the national level, the Democrats never really pull it together in the way that the Whigs do. And then one other thing that you mentioned with the camp meetings is that the Whigs are very much influenced by the Second Great Awakening and by the uh, religious revivals that were taking place. And they're, they see themselves as the party, you know, to use modern terms, the party of family values. And mm -hmm. so as they latch on to those religious trappings, they mm -hmm. transform them into, into, into a political context in a way that the Democrats really don't do in 1840 to their disadvantage. Yeah, it's so I, I, I do have to appreciate too that um this whole like log ca log cabin and hard cider campaigns that the Harrison camp runs and you 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 were very nice in the way you talked about it, but the sort of like yeah, they're just lying about it. Right. <laughs> and it, it right. feels like that's kind of the mainstay of politics, right? It's sort of like how I I'm this rich billionaire, and it doesn't matter if we, we have a certain person now in mind, because most politicians are. They, right. They're rich people, and they're trying to connect with the, lo the little man, and they're all right. trying to present themselves like, I'm just like you. And it's like, no, you're not. <laughs> like, yeah, Harrison, you know, the Whigs um, take a, a Democratic attack. So the Democrats, there was a Democratic newspaper editor who had talked about, you know, how old Harrison was, and you know, if you just gave him a pension, he would sit in his log cabin and drink hard cider by the fire. And the Whigs take that and flip it around, and they create right. this persona of Harrison, who is a scion of a rich Virginia family, um, had had privilege throughout his entire life, and they mm -hmm. turn him into this farmer who's out in the fields. They have these political cartoons where he's had he has his sleeves rolled up, he's out there tilling the ground. Um, and then Van Buren, who grew up the son of a tavern keeper, is portrayed right. as this rich snob. Um, right. And it, it really it really shows you, as you were saying, how politics is about perception. And it's about the perception that parties present, but it's also about the perception that audiences are willing to take in. Mm -hmm. And voters were, I don't know that they were hoodwinked by what the Whigs did, but they certainly embraced the idea that Harrison was the one who was a common man and representative mm -hmm. of them versus Van Buren, who came from common circumstances. Right. But messaging matters. Yes, <laughs> how you, how you did this, this across to people, right? And Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about Tyler for a second, because Tyler is, um, wow, it just, <laughs> is there any, like, Okay, let, let's start with this because it, it's making the rounds on like TikTok and a few places currently these presidential ratings. And obviously we have, again, the usual suspects like Trump, Buchanan are down there in the bottom. Mm -hmm. Why don't we put Tyler down there? He doesn't seem like the most <laughs> eloquent of politicians, if I'm going to say it that way. Yeah, you know, presidential ranks and rankings are such a parlor game anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, they're a good way to have conversations like we're having. You know, why don't we rank Tyler lower? Why is Polk ranked so much higher? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't know why Tyler's not lower. 
uh, because, and it may be that people just don't, even those who are polled, uh, and I think the most recent one was a group of political scientists, they don't really know that much about them. And so they kind of pass over and yeah, I've kind of heard of this guy. He served one term, you know, we'll rank in mid or lower mid and then move on to the ones that are really important. Um, but he is very consequential in the fact that he does some things during his administration that set the stage for Polk mm -hmm. and those who come after him and the fact that he uh, is the first um, president where there are serious efforts to, or at least serious conversations made to impeach him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a very relevant topic in more modern times. And, um, you know, some of the same arguments are being used uh, today that were used then, you know, right. the president overstepping his, his boundaries, you know, uh, trying to use executive authority in unconstitutional ways, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it sounds very familiar with some, some more recent examples. True. And that, that was very interesting because I, like, Tyler was not, like you said, most people don't know much about Tyler, like, except for the annexation of Texas and maybe the little gun explosion that, you right. have um and beyond that it's sort of like he's this caretaker like harrison dies and we're going to polk and polk is the ones that we all talk about because right. yeah he's, he's the guy that mexican war and everything but it it is interesting how sometimes we overlook these figures that have so much meaning to us t currently in in political terms uh with regard to like an impeachment like at that stage, correct me if I'm wrong, I know we have at least one or two judges that we try to impeach by this point. Mm -hmm. So it's it's still a very new idea to even think about applying impeachment against a sitting president. Even. Right. And, and, and Tyler's an interesting case because it's not even just the impeachment question. It's the fact that he's the first vice president to well, yeah. ascend to the presidency. At, on the death of, of a president. And so there are these questions about, is he simply a caretaker till the next election? Mm -hmm. Is he someone who does the minimum? Um, right. and, or is he actually the president with all of the duties assigned to a president? And so there are these discussions that are taking place that really won't be resolved until the 20th century. But Tyler also contributes to those discussions as well. Was there any kind of just, Kind of going off on this for a second i know that part of the andrew johnson impeachment like they were they're being concerns about him being removed from office was also that a lot of people didn't want the person that then was next in line was there any consideration with that with tyler that people were like you know i we really don't want this new this other person to to step into the position um Hmm. Uh, I don't recall any discussion of that. Um, certainly, well, I say certainly, maybe they didn't even think that far down the road. Right. Um, because right. with the Whigs, it seems like the, the impeachment efforts, I should mention, are coming from the Whigs. And so it's right. not even their own, from his own guys. Party. <laughs> so it's internal. And so I'm not even sure the Whigs are thinking that far down the road. Maybe they're just yeah. upset. I mean, they right. were upset with Tyler. And so. Um, it may just be that they were emotionally acting in the moment and not thinking about what are the next steps that we're going to take, you know, to move on. Right. Like, wow. Right. Well, it's academic at this point anyway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Then let's talk briefly about you have like. If my count is correct, there were six major issues that you talked about with regard to the um, lead up to the election of 1848. There was economics, corruption, um, personality issues, slavery, expansion, and Catholicism. Which one of those six did you think were was the most important? Um, so... If you'd asked me this before I wrote the book, I would have said expansionism, you know, okay. instinct, because that's that's what we all think, right? Right. I mean, that's that's how I always taught the forty four election. Right. You know, I would skip from the Jacksonian period. I would usually skip over Van Buren, the eighteen forty right. election. I would mention them briefly and then move on to yeah. 
Texas Annexation, Manifest Destiny, Folk, Mexican-American War. Right. Um, so once I started doing research, expansionism is still very important. There's no getting around that. It plays a critical role in the election. But I started to pay more attention to these other issues. Mm -hmm. um, so you have old issues like banking and tariffs and right. you know just general economics and that Americans were concerned about leading into 44. You have questions about personality. You know, Henry Clay, for example, who looked to be the leading Whig contender going into 44. Uh, he had, there were questions about his um, moral life, you know, his personal life. There were questions about, you know, the fact that he had been in politics for so long. Is he mm -hmm. someone that we really want right. in the presidency? I mean, you want experience, but, you know, are there any new things he can actually bring to the table? Um, and then I, I was looking at these these emerging issues and I tried to I tried to be clear in using the terms traditional and emerging because I think it's not that people didn't stop talking about tariffs or stop mm -hmm. talking about banking or those, those types of things. They're still looking at those things, but there are these emerging issues, again, issues that had been present and even had been part of of presidential politics, but they come to the forefront more so in 44. Mm -hmm. So things like slavery, things like um, the nativism, the anti-Catholic mm -hmm. nativism that burst into um, the campaign in 44, in the summer of 44. So I, I, again, expansionism is very important, certainly. And, and I would argue that, you know, Polk's nomination by the Democrats is really turns on expansionism and Texas in particular. But once the nominations are made, the campaign goes along several tracks with Texas mm -hmm. only being one of those and these other issues very important to trying to influence or sway voters one way or the other. Right. Yeah, then it's it, it's definitely how I always taught C. Like you you kind of like maybe you talk a little bit about the economic depression with Van Buren and then Harrison, Tyler sort of like yeah, we, we talk about Texas independence and <laughs> that's the lead over into Polk's election. And that's like, really, it, it is what you don't have time, eh? But it's sort of the way you do it. Sad right. like we don't spend more time on, on Tyler in that. Yeah. Now that said, um, since we're, we're talking about like, changing some misconceptions about elections during this period. The other part that I always told my students was candidates, they don't go out, they don't campaign. And obviously that's still the case. But what really impressed me and surprised me with your book was how much Polk, Van Buren, Clay, before the convention are hitting the campaign trail to say, I'm, I'm going to be the candidate. And like, it's almost like modern politics in that they're going state by state, going to these different communities and talking. Right. Why don't we talk more about that? Because it seems like they are doing almost like modern style politicking for their candidacy. I think that as historians, we, we have accepted the narrative that the 1840 election, you know, leads to this explosion of interest. You know, the voter turnout mm -hmm. rate is over 80% for the first time. Um, there's this massive interest. And so we we sort of dig down an inch deep and talk about here's why people are are interested and excited. And then we just let that that narrative fall off after that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it, it's because we as historians just assume that things continue that way or if we just haven't done the work to dig mm -hmm. down and see why do things continue that way? Because they do. I mean, it is modern politics in many ways. So we, I think it's incumbent upon us as historians to dig down and see how is this taking place on the lower levels, at the state and local levels, and then build that up into a larger narrative about how national politics is changing. Mm -hmm. um, and so these candidates or the ones who wanted to be the nominees, you know, Van Buren and Polk and Clay and others, they are going out. You know, Van Buren goes on this nationwide tour in 1842, where he touches almost every state in the Union. Mm -hmm. And he goes 
he sets out to go, number one, to visit family in South Carolina and then to go visit Jackson because Jackson's on his deathbed uh, for years, um, <laughs> reportedly. Um, but Van Buren wants to meet with him one more time. But as he's doing that, again, he's going all these different places and he gives sometimes very short political speeches, sometimes very long political speeches. Mm -hmm. And even if he's not giving speeches, he's meeting people. And I think he's testing the waters to see, are people still interested? And if yeah. they are, what are the things that they're concerned about? You know, what kind of like things primary, right? Exactly. Yeah. And Clay does a very similar thing. He'll go down to New Orleans from Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, he'll go down there to check on his on his business uh, endeavors. And then on his way back, he just stops at all these different places <laughs> in different states and yeah. gives speeches. And he's really doing the same thing. And so I think you're right. It is almost like a primitive primary system where they're yeah. testing the waters to see, am I viable? If I'm viable, what are the mm -hmm. things I need to pay attention to so that when I become the nominee, I'm able to address those things yeah. right from the start? It, it's kind of funny when you say that, that we haven't, maybe we haven't paid enough, close enough attention to it. And you, immediately Michael Holt's book, Rise and Fall of the Wake Par American Wake Party came to mind. You're, I'm kind of like 1,200 pages and he didn't talk about this? <laughs> uh, Surprisingly. <laughs> I guess. Uh, needed some more research. Yeah. God, that could have. <laughs> that's a 1200 page book <laughs> could have been the results there poor grad students that have to read would have yeah. had to read that <laughs> um, all right um that said so with regard to this primer early proto primary stuff it doesn't always work out as as you also nicely illustrate with with let's start with clay and the raleigh ladder <laughs> that's yeah, Clay, um, you know, he had been a perennial candidate. He had he had lost um, in 32. Uh, he had lost in 24. Uh, he didn't run in 36, which I don't know if that would have been his best chance. I think 40 was probably his best chance, but yeah. the Whigs don't dominate him. Um, so I, I think he's he's probably very frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, and he, as he goes on these tours, he's trying to get a sense of what Americans are concerned about. And he's picking up on the tariff and banking and, you know, all the traditional issues. Mm -hmm. And then when people try to bring to his attention, you know, Texas annexation is starting to be talked about, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the Senate is talking about it. The house is talking about it. Tyler is definitely talking about it. Um, voters are talking about it. He kind of, shoes it away and says, oh, no, you know, this isn't going to be really that important. Uh, and it's a miscalculation. Mm -hmm. And then he comes out um, with this letter uh, in which he basically says that he's not in favor of the immediate annexation of Texas. And that really sets the tone for the for his campaign, because mm -hmm. in doing that, he is not showing the foresight to see that this is an issue that's going to explode. And so right. he has to backtrack from that position a couple of times over the course of the campaign. Mm -hmm. And all that does is it, it says to some people is that he's being wishy-washy. You know, right. he doesn't, he doesn't really have a principled stand on annexation. Uh, he's just trying to figure out what voters want yeah. and try to adapt to that, which of course politicians do that, but you're not supposed yeah. to be so obvious about it. Right. right? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, on the other hand, like, uh, like, I mean, you have to feel feel sorry for Henry Clay. I mean, the guy had tried really hard so many times, and just it never worked out. Yeah, yeah. He he's probably <laughs> from this era, certainly, but even I think in all of presidential politics, yeah. he's probably one of the top three to five candidates who deserve to be president. I mean, with his experience and. Just everything about him, he probably would have been a good president, but circumstances and a variety of things just happened to prevent him from becoming uh, someone who could lead the country. And he, there's no one else that lost that many attempts <laughs> to become president. Either. I don't think so. I don't so think so. Again, it's very sad for the man that just like he, he never was able to kind of go over the go over that. 50% mark. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
And I think the other part worth talking about here too is that he operated under false assumption that it is going to be Van Buren who is going to run against me. And Van right. Buren does the same mistakes that Clay does with his right. statements. Right, yeah. So Van Buren um, acts as if he's going to be the nominee, which, again, he's a politician. That's how you're supposed to act. And a lot of Democrats do. Um, yeah. Until uh, in early 44, annexation, Texas annexation becomes a, a major issue. And Van Buren doesn't pivot. Um, mm -hmm. And in his in his case, I think it's principled. You know, he mm -hmm. he very he's very adamant in the statement that he issues, the letter that he writes, that mm -hmm. he's opposed to immediate annexation. He lays out at length, you know, the reasoning behind it. Um, and then he sticks he sticks to his guns when he doesn't win the Democratic nomination. Um, he doesn't backtrack and say, oh, I wish that I'd done things differently or I regret. You know, mm -hmm. he says that, you know, this was my stance and I knew that it would cost me and it did. But this was what I believed we needed to do. I, I hate to say it, but it's nice to see principled guys <laughs> in <laughs> politics for once. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. And. and you know, Van Buren was a little bit bitter about it yeah, uh, sure. toward toward the end of 44 into 45. I think I don't know that he was bitter about losing mm -hmm. the nomination, but I think he was bitter that he had sort of been shunted to the side for, mm -hmm. for Polk and for this new era of Democratic politicians. Um, right. So it may be a little bit of sour grapes for him in, in the sense that he had built the party. And I think maybe he felt a little bit entitled to sure. get the nomination again. But um, as far as annexation, he sticks to his guns on that. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> which leads us to the, let's start with the Wake Convention, because the presidential vote is easy for them. Right. And then Freelinghausen. <laughs> That's like, <Ooh. laughs> uh, exactly, right? Like, no, I, I bet if we quiz most students have had taken a U.S. history course. They would not know that this man actually ran for vice president. Right, right. Yeah, so the Whigs uh, have an easy choice in Clay. There's some rumblings from maybe Daniel Webster or somebody else, but mm -hmm. really Clay is yeah. is the choice. But the VP nomination, um, there there's a little bit of mystery there, a little bit of intrigue. So you have um, Honest John Davis from Massachusetts who... Um, by his name, would have provided a nice counterbalance to all the questions mm -hmm. about Clay's morality. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately for Davis, he was in Massachusetts, and so he and Webster had had a falling out, and you know Webster and his supporters probably worked to keep Davis from getting the nomination. Um, you have Millard Fillmore mm -hmm. from New York, uh, who did not want the nomination, um, and um, Imagine and, that, right? Like, right, right. Like, don't nominate me. Don't nominate me. <laughs> um, who um, doesn't get the nomination? Uh, later becomes president, of course, when he is VP under Zachary Taylor, and Zachary Taylor dies. Um, then you have John Sargent, who had run with Clay in '32 uh, as Clay's VP um, running mate. Um, Sergeant had retired from Congress in 41, had not done a whole lot since then. And so he's not really a viable candidate. Um, and so you're left with Frelinghuysen, who has the advantage of being someone who was known as a strong Christian, mm -hmm. uh, a man of moral principle. He had shown that, for example, during the Indian removal debate in the early 1830s, he had been very outspoken in his opposition to Indian removal on moral grounds. And so if you want, uh, I think I used the phrase, and they used the phrase at the time, saint and sinner, you know, you have the sinner at yes, the top, you use play, that one. <laughs> but you have saint, you know, as the VP nominee to kind of try to counterbalance that and appeal to the Whig base because the Whig base, again, had grown up and had been born in this evangelical Christian ethos. Mm -hmm. And so... Clay isn't really representative of that, but if you can put someone with him um, mm -hmm. who can appeal to that base, then maybe that softens Clay and makes him more palatable. Yeah, that's 
it, it's strategic thinking. I mean, right, that's, right. That's, I mean, it's very similar to what you saw, I think, in 2016 with Donald Trump and Mike Pence, right? Yeah. You have Donald Trump. The who, saint and the sinner. <laughs> right. <laughs> Almost by literally. all accounts was, yeah. you know, <laughs> and then you have Mike Pence, who was a very strong evangelical Christian, recognized and made Trump palatable to a lot of people in 2016 yeah. who would not have voted for Trump otherwise, probably. Yeah, yeah that's a... Uh... And the messaging then that mattered with that, and in addition right. to it, right. um, <clears throat> so let's stick with the saints aspect because the the other part that I don't think a lot of people always know about the eighteen forty four election is Joseph Smith, right, right. the leader of the Mormons running for president. Uh, or at least intending to run for president, I should cautiously say there. Right. What was he thinking? Like, there's no chance he could have won this. Right. So Joseph Smith, uh, in early 1844, he uh, and his council um, had a revelation that he was supposed to run for the presidency. And the the impetus was to establish a... Uh, a theo democracy, uh, mm -hmm. so essentially taking um, Mormon religious principles and beliefs and aligning them with American democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so Smith uh, begins to put together a campaign. Uh, the church, the LDS Church, sends out um, missionaries who are really uh, they call them electioneering missionaries who go out and not only try to convert people right. to the church, but also to convert them right. to supporting Joseph Smith as a presidential candidate. Um, and, and the thing about the thing about this, this campaign by Smith is that he, I mean, I guess he and the Mormons believe that he could win because this was something ordained by God, that this was something that God was sure. going to orchestrate. Sure. Um, you know, realistically, if you're outside the church, you look at Smith and, think this guy really doesn't have a shot to win a national election um but you know one of one of the intriguing things about him is because of where mormons have been located you know they had traveled from new york to ohio to missouri to illinois and had had landed by that point in illinois you know potentially could they sway voters one way or the other and in a close election you know could they potentially serve as a tipping point um, yeah. for, for choosing one candidate or the other. Again, I think that is that is us looking at it logically mm -hmm. and rationally from a modern perspective. But at the time, I don't think that Smith and his his church followers were thinking that way. I think they really did believe right. God would orchestrate this so that he would achieve victory. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, Smith is assassinated um, in June of 44, not because of his presidential politics, but because of um, things going on within the church right. uh, itself. So it's it's a religious assassination, murder, really, not a political assassination, but uh, that pulls him out of the campaign, you know, for whatever it would have been worth. Right. Yeah. And and no replacement is nominated, so <clears throat> we can maybe file this realism returns. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, then let's... Uh... Let's stick with the um, the odd candidates because the other candidate that drops out is the president, John Tyler. Right. <laughs> Who's right. like so... he 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 was really thinking he could like at least run a third party candidate candidacy or maybe somebody will pick him up. Right. Yeah. So so Tyler's whole campaign in forty four is predicated on him latching on to Texas annexation as an issue that he believed would create a third way. So a pathway between Democrats and Whigs where he would be able to garner enough votes to win his own term as president. Um, so he stays in the election or in the campaign until um, August of 44. Uh, there's a convention where he's nominated. Uh, there's no VP nominee because well, maybe people didn't want to run with him, but uh, they, they kind of take the strategy that the Democrats had taken in 1840, 
where they nominate a presidential candidate and then leave it up to the states to decide what they want to do uh, mm -hmm. for the VP. Um, but it really, to me, it really speaks to to Tyler, I guess, his arrogance in some ways that he truly believes that he can find a pathway um, using this one issue of Texas annexation. But two, um, he does look for one of the other parties to nominate him. I mean, mm -hmm. especially going into the Democratic part, into the Democratic convention, um, there are rumblings that, you know, he might emerge as the Democratic nominee, which again is so ironic because he had been the Whig on the Whig <laughs> ticket in 40. Uh, but, but I not think. Not unheard it, of, let's put it that yeah, way. <laughs> yeah. So it's not, it's not just about Tyler. And I think what I see is his arrogance, but it's also about there are people who see annexation as the key issue that's going to determine the campaign. Right. And so they see Tyler as the main champion of that. And so mm -hmm. if they can provide a critical mass of supporters or voters behind him, you know, maybe they can find right. a way forward. And and the, the thing about political parties in this era, and I, I think this is something that I, it's a trap I fall into, is that we tend to think that they're these, they're these massive voters who are locked in to mm -hmm. these long-term parties. And certainly there is something to, you know, what John Grinspan calls the virgin voter, that once you mm -hmm. cast your first vote for a, for a party, you tend to stick with that party. Right. But this is still the early years of, of political parties in the United States as we right. think of them. Yeah, uh, The Democrats at that point had not existed for even two decades, and mm -hmm. the Whigs even for a decade. And so I think right. that there's there's maybe more thinking that there's an opportunity to have mm -hmm. a third way, to have a third party that can break through. Whereas mm -hmm. today, you know, when we think That's... about a third party breaking through, it's just not even a realistic possibility at this right. point. Right. Right. Ross Perot. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh yeah. Let's not go there. Oh, my God. <laughs> of course, then when, when we think about it, Tyler does play, play spoiler on almost in, in regard to like, like the, issue of expansion is a is an important one and he 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 solves it on some level with the in inclusion of texas through not a treaty but a joint resolution of congress which right they, right that that's kind of uh, if i can be crass that's kind of his last middle finger to the united states as he's leaving <laughs> office is to make sure that he gets the recognition i mean the yeah. process isn't yeah. completed until polk comes into office but Tyler, I think, tries to grab the limelight yeah. <laughs> from Polk as he's leaving office. <laughs> like that line in his history books, he's going to get right. that I'm right. the one that got Texas, not That's Polk. right. <laughs> <laughs> That's often how I taught it too, where it's like, oh, yeah, he just, he got into the history books with this. <laughs> but he's, he, of course, this goes beyond the book. It's like he then leaves Polk with this, like, ah, oh, and I have to now deal with Mexico and I, right. I, I'm I'm being set I have to kind of clear the mess that he makes. So right. it's not right. enviable what what happens right. there, obviously. Um all right, James Bernie. James E. <laughs> Bernie. Um oh, he, had been, he had been an enslaver, had had a religious conversion, and um believed that came to believe that slavery was wrong um, and then evolved and transformed to where he not only believed that it, that it was wrong, but um, that slavery needed to be gotten rid of and that African-Americans could achieve equality. I mean, he becomes an abolitionist um, within a span yeah. of about 15 years. Um, and so he, he had been nominated by the Liberty Party in 1840. They had garnered three, 4,000 votes total yeah, across the nation. So then they renominated him again mm -hmm. um, and started to put together a party apparatus looking forward to mm -hmm. 44. Um, and he he doesn't, I don't think, has a realistic shot of winning. Right. But the way the way that I've always thought about the Liberty Party and this, this book really affirmed it to me is that they are driven by ideology, not pragmatism. 
Mm -hmm. They have discussions about being pragmatic. Do we support someone who is just anti-slavery or Mm -hmm. do we want to stick to our ideological purity that we want someone who believes slavery is wrong and Mm -hmm. that, you know, there's equality available Mm -hmm. and they stick to the ideological part as a party. So um, I don't think Bernie has a realistic chance of winning in 44, but the Liberty Party is playing the long game. They're looking Mm -hmm. at we need to accrue more and more political support. And one of the ways that you do that, you do it at the local and state level, of course, but you also have to have national attention. And so Mm -hmm. Bernie provides that opportunity in 44. Mm -hmm. uh, And he does much better than in 1840, you know, still doesn't have a shot at winning, but he does much better um, in 44. And so it really lays the groundwork, I think, for what comes after the Liberty Party, the Free Social Party, and then the Republican Party. So in many ways, Bernie... Uh, and the Libertyites don't achieve success in 44, but they're laying the foundation for what comes later with Lincoln and the Republicans. Even though it, it sounded like he did not really want to do it. Like it, the sort of like, what was it, like a couple of months that he, before he responds to like the nomination right. and then he, he stays out in Michigan, kind of the right. frontier <laughs> and like just kind of like, yeah, I know you nominated me, but I really don't want to do this. <laughs> it, it... Yeah, you, you know, Bernie, in some ways, he's an enigma uh, still to me. Uh, there's, well, there's there's a, a biography to be written. That's... Do what? <laughs> there's a biography to be written there. There is. I really think um, that if if someone wanted to take on Bernie, given all the scholarship we have now, Mm -hmm. Um, you could write a very insightful um, look at not just his life as a person, but also his importance to American political history, to American Mm -hmm. racial history. Um, So if there are any graduate students or even any scholars out there looking for a topic, I would encourage you to write about Bernie because he, to me, he's one of those people that we haven't paid enough attention to. Right. Yeah. Totally. Ooh, I guess that leaves us with the dark horse in the room, <laughs> the Democratic Party, and I guess, shall we say, the crisis of, oddly enough, too, both parties were in Baltimore as a Baltimore nomination and who to right. run. Like, right, right. And Polk wasn't even running for the first day and set for seven ballots right yeah so going into the democratic convention i think most delegates most americans most party members thought van buren would come out with the mm-hmm. nomination mm-hmm. um but there had been some behind the scenes operations going on after van buren's letter opposing the immediate annexation of texas came out Uh, You have in particular Southerners, um, people like Robert Walker from Mississippi, for example, Mm -hmm. who are starting to look at Van Buren as someone that probably most of them had never trusted on the issue of slavery. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they're looking at him now and thinking, you know, he doesn't want Anik, he doesn't want Texas to come in. Uh, They they're just uncertain about him and they want Mm -hmm. someone whom they can trust. They want someone who. Uh, adheres to their understanding of the Democratic Party, which was pro-slavery, pro-annexation. And so this this group, Robert Robert Walker and some others, start to put together this plan going into the convention to keep Van Buren from getting the nomination. And so the way that they do that, and this this is something that the Democrats had put into place in 32 at their first convention to actually help Van Buren. They had set a standard <laughs> of getting, yes, the irony, of course. They had set a standard of a two-thirds um, bar, voting bar, to become mm-hmm. the nominee. And right. so these delegates go in. Um, Van Burenites think they're going to just have a simple majority vote. Uh, mm-hmm. There would be, you know, it would be unanimous, of course. It's Van Buren. Yeah. Um, right. And then this, this, this anti-Van Buren group puts into place the two-thirds vote. And Van Buren never gets to that point. He has a majority from the first ballot. He has a majority, 
but he doesn't get to the two thirds um, level. And he actually starts to lose votes to people like John C. Calhoun, to Lewis Cass, Mm -hmm. um, to Richard M. Johnson, to these other potential candidates. And Polk is not part of the conversation. You know, he's not one of the ones getting those, those votes for the top spot, but there are these conversations taking place at night in the hotels and the bars, saloons, Mm -hmm. where people like Cave Johnson from Tennessee, Andrew Jackson Donaldson, who's Andrew Jackson's nephew, also from Tennessee, George Bancroft from Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. um, and others, Robert Walker included, who are putting together this plan that as it becomes clear that Van Buren is not going to be the nominee, we need someone to be able to step in. Mm-hmm. someone we can trust. And so Polk's name begins to be put forward as that potential choice. And so by the time they get um, to the seventh ballot, it's very clear Van Buren's not going to win uh, the nomination. Lewis Cass is coming up, um, but there were a lot of people, a lot of Democrats who weren't excited about Cass. Sure. He, had been, <laughs> he had been in um, France um, yeah. for a number of years um, until I think uh, late 1842, he had not really joined into the campaigning like Van Buren and some other mm-hmm. potential nominees had done um, uh, leading up to the 44 convention. And so uh, that offered the opportunity for Polk to emerge mm-hmm. as, you know, not an unknown candidate. And that's one of the things I try to emphasize from the start. It's not that Polk was unknown. People knew who he was. Right. He was someone whose political career was on the downside though. And he was someone that people had not talked about as being the, the nominee. And so when his name emerges, uh, it's very clear very quickly that he is going to be the nominee. And it only takes two ballots for him to um, become the nominee and to become the person that Democrats are going to hang their hat on in 44 to run against Clay. It, it, it seems like he was a candidate that offended the least number of people, right? Yeah, in some ways, yes. But in other ways, the important thing about Polk was, and this comes from the 1840 election, when he had been talked about as a VP nominee, he has this nickname of Young Hickory. And so there are a lot of people who look at Polk literally as a younger version of Andrew Jackson. And even though Andrew Jackson was not universally loved within the Democratic Party, even though he had been out of office you know, for a number of years at this point, he was still the elder statesman of the party. He still had a mm-hmm. lot of influence. And he was someone who, even in 44, was very actively writing people about the necessity of Texas and you know, we need to get Texas to not only expand the United States, but also to protect slavery. And so if you're looking for someone who's the closest thing to Andrew Jackson without mm-hmm. being Jackson, James K. Polk, for many Democrats, is that person. And so um, I think a lot of Democrats are willing to jump on board the Polk train because they see him as their best shot. Yeah. And. I mean, he lives, as as we said earlier, like just about 30, 40 minutes away from Jackson. And of course, very different political career trajectories, like military career uh, trajectories between the two of them. So it's there. There's more difference and similarity, really, between them. But yeah, it's Western frontiersman, right? That looks so inviting. Right. Uh, so that takes up the first two days. <laughs> and then the next challenge of who do you run with? Right. Yeah. And so yes. The... And then it is Silas Wright, right? Right. So um, the Democrats, you know, in hindsight, if things had turned out differently, if Silas Wright had been willing to be the presidential nominee once Van Buren clearly wasn't going to be, um, you know, things probably would have been different for the Democrats. Um, You know, maybe Wright would have won the the election anyway. Maybe he would have won by a larger margin. Um, But that was, that was really who the Van Buren wing of the Democrats wanted to be the presidential nominee if their guy couldn't get it. 
So okay. once it's clear Polk is going to get the nomination, then they turn to Silas Wright as maybe the VP nominee. You know, okay. maybe he can help balance out and right. give that Van Buren wing something. But the problem with Silas Wright is he did not want to be president and he did not want to be vice president. He had no interest. And the Democrats actually beg him, beg him to come and to make himself available. And he sends telegrams and letters and then finally um, sends messengers back to the convention saying, I'm not interested. And so the Democrats have to pivot. <laughs> like Millard Fillmore, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They have to pivot and they have to figure out who else to choose. And, you know, they could have chosen any of the other potential presidential nominees. Um, and they do consider some of them. John Fairfield from Maine, uh, his name comes up um, as a very strong contender. Uh, but then they eventually settle on George Dallas from Pennsylvania, who just happens to be related by marriage to Robert Walker. And so there's that, again, that that contingent of Democrats who've been working to keep Van Buren from winning to get Polk nominated, um, who are pushing for Dallas as well. Um, and really Dallas's advantage is he comes from Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania nice. was known as the Keystone state for a reason. Um, he is someone who would provide some stability for Democrats when it came to issues important to Pennsylvanians, things like the tariff, for example. Um, they could use Dallas to help secure Pennsylvania for their party. And so much like with modern day politics, you will oftentimes see VP nominees chosen, not because they're one heartbeat away from the presidency, um, not because, you know, we trust them to become president, but because they bring some constituency mm -hmm. to the party or they bring some um importance to bringing a state into the party for that election and with dallas I, again they're not even with tyler coming to the presidency they're not thinking about him as oh he could become president they're thinking how can he help us with pennsylvania how can he help mm -hmm. us with the tariff issue yeah and going back to your to your comment about tyler and texas annexation as sort of a sort of middle finger it, it almost feels like based on the things you're saying that this convention is really a middle finger to Van Buren. <laughs> that <laughs> we, we don't want you. We don't like you. And we will not even allow anyone associated with you to be anywhere near the presidency. Yeah, I, I think maybe certainly for the Robert Walker wing uh, of the Democrats, um, as I said, they, they just did not trust Van Buren. They had never really trusted him. Um, because he was a northerner who supposedly had pro-slavery sympathies, but during this era, that That's was not that was not enough. And what's really ironic is that when you get to the 1850s with Franklin mm -hmm. Pierce and with James Buchanan, um, they had they proved themselves um, enough that that Democrats were willing to take chances with them. But in the mid 1840s, mm -hmm. Van Buren was not someone that they trusted. Mm -hmm. Um, that think, circling back real quick because you did mention George Bancroft earlier, and mm -hmm. that's an a sad one too because Van Buren reached out to Bancroft to write his campaign biography. Right, right. They, <laughs> and yeah, they had a pre-existing relationship. Yeah, Van Buren and Bancroft had this pre-existing relationship, and um, I don't know that Van Buren had any animosity toward Bancroft. Um, we're still working through those documents in our project, oh. um, but um, I, I, I can't imagine that he wasn't a little bit hurt by the fact mm -hmm. that Bancroft um, essentially stabbed him in the back. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Ooh, would not want to be in the room with him at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um. Let's see here. Uh, let's. We already know the outcome here. I mean, Polk wins at the end. But one thing that I found, there were a couple of quotes that I sent you in preparation to the interview, and the one on two hundred and page two hundred and eight really stood out to me because it was, it spoke in part to like the the period, but also kind of the issues that we're still dealing with. And it's I'm gonna read it here. 
accusations of voter fraud were also prevalent, this form of electoral corruption was not uncommon in the mid 19th century United States. Like, I mean, we all know it, right? Like, we have all heard the story of Kansas and the 10,000 extra votes that miraculously appear in that little county of 100 in what happens in. Frank Towers has illustrated in Baltimore during elections. And I'm going to pose it this way. How many elections did we have where we didn't have to worry about <laughs> fraud and corruption? Zero. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, 44, it's so fascinating because I, I guess I had never really honed in on the fact that voter fraud was a concern until mm -hmm. more recent elections we've gone through. Right. And so it was very much at the forefront of my mind as I was, I was researching and writing, you know, that uh, my, my flag was that my antenna was up to pay attention mm -hmm. to that. And both parties are accusing each other of all kinds of fraud. They're, they're yeah. accusing Whigs are accusing Democrats of paying immigrants um, you know, fresh off the boat, so to speak, to mm -hmm. to cast their vote for Polk and Dallas. Yeah. Um, they're they're um, ignoring or or running around the the requirements for residency to to help immigrant voters vote. Um, and then you have the Democrats who are looking at Whigs, and they're not you know, making accusations about immigrants necessarily, but Democrats are looking at Whigs and saying that they're bribing people to vote mm -hmm. here and then to go somewhere else and vote here and, um, you know, to cast double ballots. That's a big concern that you would have these paper ballots that were already pre-printed and, mm -hmm. you know, they would be stuck together. And so when you cast your vote, you have drop three or four box or presented it, you're, yeah, you're present, you're doing more than one. Um, and then you have this really a very egregious case that actually changes the outcome of a state election in Louisiana. There's a U.S. representative uh, by the name of John Slidell. Who, <laughs> oh, no surprise who, that he is involved. <laughs> I know. he. If you know anything about Civil War history, which your listeners will, uh, he comes up again in the 1850s. Um, but Slidell takes uh, men from New Orleans who weren't able to vote there and ships them, literally ships them to another parish nearby <laughs> and allows them to vote. And the it, that that parish, I forget the exact numbers, but in 1840, the numbers were the total number of votes cast was something like 200 or 300. And then in the 1844 election, the number of votes cast was over a thousand. Um, right. and it, you know, if I remember correctly, the number of voters didn't even reach a thousand in that parish. And so the fact that you have this, this very blatant disregard, uh, yeah. this very blatant, um, use of voter fraud, um, changes Louisiana's election outcome because Louisiana, the total number of votes separating Clay and Polk in that election was around 700. And so mm -hmm. those votes actually change the outcome of Louisiana, which goes to Polk. Now, right. it doesn't change the election uh, sure. in terms of who would have won, but um, that's a that's a it's such an egregious example of voter fraud. Yeah. Um, and, and so who knows how many uh, how many votes elsewhere, like due to intimidation or violence right. or Absolutely. exactly this may have right. like because that's like. I don't want to get too far ahead, but that's exactly like it's a very close election, right? It's 40,000 votes separating the two candidates. And right. like you, I think of all the chapters, I think the last one was the most where I was like, that that should be another book here <laughs> because you, you actually crunch numbers in that. And you're looking at it and you're like, a few thousand votes in a handful of states are making the difference in the outcome of this election. Right, right. Yeah, so Louisiana is a good case. Tennessee is an even closer state. There are about 100 votes that separate um, Clay and Polk. Clay, Clay wins the state, much to Jackson's chagrin. Um, <laughs> but 
but it's a little over a hundred votes separate those two. And there are, there are five or six States where the, the number of votes between the two candidates is less than a thousand. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at percentage points, places like New York, the, the, the vote total between the two was a little over 5,000, but the percentage is pretty minuscule 1.6 or 1.2%, mm -hmm. something like that. So there are these very thin, mm -hmm. razor thin margins between the two candidates. And I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, elections in this case, like this one, turn on such small margins that one or two or three issues, you know, one or two or three rallies, you know, mm -hmm. things can have such a difference. And the problem in doing elections during this era, of course, is that we don't have polling. We don't have we don't have a good ways to really quantify, you know, does this issue lead to a shift? Does this, mm -hmm. you know, the presence of this person at this point at a political rally make a difference? It's hard for us to get a grasp on that. Right. But I think that you can certainly see the cumulative effects of things like cultural politics, the cumulative mm -hmm. effects of things like the nativist um, violence that breaks out against immigrants in the mm -hmm. summer uh, of 1844, particularly in Philadelphia and New York City. Um, right. You know, these are all things that are going to affect the way that voters choose or choose not to support a candidate. Um, and I think that we as historians haven't paid enough attention to that. I mean, yeah. we pay attention to it, but we don't drill down. Like we were talking about earlier, we need to drill down and look at what are mm -hmm. the things that are happening? You know, what are the issues that they're talking about leading up to um, an election day? And, you know, does that make a difference compared to maybe a previous congressional election or a local election or presidential election? Right. And again, it's it's hard to know with certainty because we don't have the quanti quantitative methods to do that. But I think we can make some some assumptions based on good evidence that we do have. Well, it's, it sort of leads to the other point that you raise in the book, at least I think in two paces, that even though women couldn't vote, they participated in the conversations of politics and right. tried to make themselves felt and heard, even though, again, they, they didn't have the right to vote. So it's um, these marginalized characters that we also need to take into consideration, even though they can't participate in this political process. Right. And I, I think we've done a good job in looking at women's activity in the 1840 election. I mean, there's been mm -hmm. a lot written about women in, in the 1840 presidential campaign. Um, and there's been some written about the 44 campaign. But to me, that's another one of those gaps that I think we look at 1840 and we assume, OK, everything just kind of continues from there at the same trajectory, at the same rate, at the same whatever. Mm -hmm. But do we know that? And so part of what I tried to do, and I don't think I conclusively, um, you know, exhausted the topic, but I tried to show how there are these persistent factors from 40 that carry over into 44. And mm -hmm. my hope is that, you know, we could drill down deeper in 44, but then also let's carry that into 48, into 52, into 56. And in doing that, we can enrich the narrative that we already have, you know, Lincoln and the Republicans and, you know, all these all these things that we talk about in freshman survey courses that are important. Yeah. But let's enrich that narrative by looking at what are these other people? What are these other mm -hmm. factors that play a role? And in right. doing that, we can increase the diversity of the narrative in a way mm -hmm. that maybe makes it more appealing and certainly right. makes it more interesting to me because. Yeah. Maybe it's just that I've taught survey for so many decades that I I kind of get tired of the narrative because I, yeah. it's the same thing over and over. But if I could give a different angle to get yeah. students interested, maybe that would help them to see, oh, you know, mm -hmm. this perspective makes me think differently about why this issue was such a big issue right. in 56 or in 1860. Right. Big part of the Van Buren papers, right? Right. That's <laughs> right. That Absolutely. Kind of get that material out there for people to use. Right. Uh, and I think the biggest part that you kind of end with in your book is um, a line that always should be in everyone's mind anywhere that every vote counts, right? That it's like, like I, I, I think back to that one uh, 
state legislature election there in Virginia a few years back, where they had to literally do a coin flip I, to pick the winner because you have this vote going on, and they, like, um, yeah, like yeah, somebody else could have voted, and it could have changed the outcome of the election. <laughs> right. Yeah, and you know, I've I've had conversations with colleagues who who argue that not voting is also a political choice and it's, you know, expression of a person's politics. And I understand that. Uh, and, and, and I respect that. Yeah. Having said that, I think that with the way that the United States political system is set up, you know, casting your vote, whether it's for president down to, you know, local alderman, um, casting a vote is your chance if you're not going to run for office, it's really your chance to say, here's what I think. Yeah. And they do make a difference. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, it's 100 votes in Tennessee that separate Clay and Polk. So it's not one vote, but that's 100 votes. Yeah. That is yeah. such a small margin. And if you can get together a, a mass of people, you know, a dozen people, 100 people, 1,000 people, I mean, mm -hmm. you can really change a lot of elections. Yeah. Um, at the local and state level, perhaps, you know, at the presidential level, it's harder, but, yeah. you know, there are, there are places I think where you can make a difference. And sure. I think it's incumbent upon Americans to, to make that choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And, and, and as we kind of said at the start, there's so many things when you look at this, this election, like the Tyler administration, the election here in 1844, that there's moments where you're kind of like, ooh, isn't it nice to have, to have a time when you had good politicians? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I guess in light of the most recent news from the United States that didn't try to sell out to the enemy, like we didn't have a guy that was in bed with Britain and trying to give half the United States to Britain or something in 1844. Right. Um, but this, the contestedness of the elections, the partisanship um, is definitely, I would think, rem reminiscent of what we have today of this sort of, like you, you said that like you tend to vote as a virgin voter, you vote and you stick with it. And it sounded like a lot of voters were doing something similar, but that, there were new voters that were adding to the equation as well. Right. Right. Because the the voting population had opened up. And so you do have a lot of new voters who are coming into the system mm -hmm. and they're coming into a system that is being activated by these rallies, by these auxiliary organizations, by speeches and all these things. And so you see the beginnings of a, a, and I, I know the political party system nomenclature is controversial among American historians, but you see people entering into a system that is starting to harden, that is starting to coalesce, but they're adding to that. These new voters are adding to that. And you still see the flexibility, the shifting, the transformation that's taking place during the 1844 election mm -hmm. before sort of the lanes get carved out in the way that we maybe we think about them today. Um, and I think, you know, in today's world in the United States, we tend to think that, you know, we have the two pathways, they're well paid, they're grooved. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to break free from those, but it's happened before. Right. And I'm not, I'm not saying necessarily that it has to happen or how it has to happen, but I think as voters, we have to be aware that contingency is a real thing, that we have agency and that mm -hmm. things are not just predetermined. You know, yeah. we can change things and whether that means we just simply change within the system or we change the system or right. add to it or take away. Um, we have that opportunity and we don't just simply have to sit back and wait for things to happen to us. Nothing is inevitable. That's <laughs> but, right. But That's right. Like, this thing was one of the big lessons that my civil war classes always or my civil war teachers always were like that. That war was not inevitable. You could have changed it. And, but that leads me to, I'm going to make this uh, one of my last questions here. Assuming Van Buren would have been nominated and ran against Clay, would we have had the Mexican War at all? Or would have Texas remained independent? Uh, 
Yeah, I know. Counterfactual. Hardest yeah, question of the day. So uh, it's hard for me to see the Mexican-American war taking place because Polk, mm-hmm. yes, he was kind of handed a raw deal, but then he made it worse yes. um, by kind of by, by provoking Mexico. I don't know that Van Buren or Clay ever would have done that. So mm-hmm. I think the Mexican-American war is off the table. Texas is a harder is a harder thing. You know, it really depends on what Tyler had done um, before leaving office. If he did the exact same thing that he did, um, I mean, Texas probably does come in. But mm-hmm. you know, would Tyler have stayed in if Van Buren were the nominee? You know, what would the di- dynamics of the race have been? Would Tyler have felt the pressure, mm-hmm. um, or maybe the opportunity to bring Texas in? You know, it's it's hard to say. Certainly, I think having Polk as the nominee help drive the annexation mm-hmm. issue more so than if Van Buren had been the nominee. And I think Clay would have been happy not to talk about it. Um, so, <laughs> so, so if Van Buren, neither Van Buren nor Clay actually want to do it. And right. Tyler's the lone voice out there talking about it. I'm not sure that Texas would have become part of the U S at least at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're not going to go further than that. Of Like maybe in <laughs> 10 years down the road, it would have happened. And, uh, but yeah, it's, right. it's again like a hundred, like, like fifteen hundred votes somewhere, and it could have been yeah. that way, right? And yep. who knows yep. what the outcome would have been in that situation, right? Uh, all right. To end, uh, what uh, you have some Martin Van, Martin Van Buren papers um, to deal with? What are, what else are you dealing with? Any other project? Any other election that is? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Van Buren, like, are you going to do like what's the 18, when is he running, 48 election where he's yeah. sort of the changer in a couple of states? Uh, no, I, I don't have any ambitions for that. Um, uh, I have James Bradley, I mentioned, he was the one uh, who got me uh, to this point of, of doing mm-hmm. the Van Buren papers. He's actually co editor of the papers. He, he has a Van Buren biography coming out later this year. Oh, nice. So, that will be, uh, I hope, make a big splash for us. For me personally, I'm working on a digital project that is looking at Van Buren's tours in 39 mm-hmm. and in 42. So oh, as nice. president and then as potential nominee, yeah. looking at, you know, where does he go? What does he do? What does he say? How does that mm-hmm. have an effect on the larger context yeah. um, of his of his life and career? And then I've, I've toyed with the idea of doing a book on conspiracy theories in the Jacksonian period. Ooh. So I teach a conspiracy theories course. I'm actually teaching it this semester. And oh. so I've dabbled enough with conspiracy theories and the literature to feel comfortable using that as a lens back into the Jacksonian period. So things like anti-masonry. Right. Um, the moon hoax. The, uh, the slave power, yeah. um, you know, anti-Catholicism, oh. you know, all these various conspiracy right. theories. And Andrew Jackson has all kinds of conspiracy theories <laughs> about the world. So I've toured with the idea of maybe pursuing that. Um, oh. But it's just it's still just a, an idea. It's not something I'm wow. ready to execute. Yeah. Wow. That, I did not expect that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I also think it was sell well. So um, that's true. You know, in today's world, anything about conspiracy theories probably has a built in audience. So yeah. I'm also thinking about can I make a paycheck from this? <laughs> Which is uh, not easy with publishing books, unfortunately. That's right. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> uh, that, 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 that would be fun. That would be a very, very good popular book actually to write. I agree. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's almost like. Um, what was it, Mark Lowell's this book on secret societies, yep. right? Yep. But I right. wonder if that actually made good money for him or. Um, I don't know. I hope so. Uh, yeah, again, it, exactly. Um, all right. Well, Mark, it was a great pleasure today to talk to you about uh, the book, Who is James K. Polk's The Presidential Election of 1844, which is available with the University Press of Kansas. And other independent bookstores if you are looking for it it's worth your while it's a great book um and then again thank you and best of luck with the van buren papers thank you i appreciate it